Greetings, greetings, live YouTube followers. Welcome to my 15th YouTube Live. It's been a while. I had to make sure I knew what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. I'm grateful to see each of you here. Um, please, when you're watching this, comment, like, share, subscribe. Let me know you're watching this. Uh, comment so I know you're watching it. Um, and I know based on how this is set up, I will see your comments um, live. So please comment, like, share, subscribe. Uh, make sure you're interacting with my live YouTube. It's my 15th one now. And I'm grateful. Got a lot of things done that I wanted to get done. Looking forward to the future and grateful for what's past. So this past week, the world recognized the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. And I was thinking about ways to really understand her life. And, you know, I read a lot of novels and I wrote a special issue on the fiction of Elizabeth Nunez. She wrote several novels and this particular novel came up in my head each time <clears throat> I was reading a tweet about Queen Elizabeth. I read a post on IG or on Facebook about Queen Elizabeth. This novel I like, just stayed in my head. It's a novel called Anna in Between. It's about a editor, a publishing editor named Anna. And she's dealing with the news of her mother having breast cancer. And just the way that Elizabeth Nunez writes this novel um, reminded me of how people think of the queen. My mom and my sister, they were two individual. And my, I have two sisters, my older and my younger sister. They were in like knowledge wise, the life of the queen. They were interested. They kept abreast of it. My good friend that I no longer talk to, but I hope is okay. Her name is Grace. Um, Grace was also born in Jamaica. And she she explained why many Jamaican women have a fascination with the Queen Elizabeth, you know, and the whole royal family, and especially Princess Diana, who you know has since passed. And so for me, though, I've been less than interested. But as I tweeted, and a few people retweeted, um, the passing of Queen Elizabeth is an extraordinary opportunity to. Um, talk about the unification of Africa and the value of Africa unifying. Um, the discourse about it, I tweeted, allows an important opportunity for Pan-Africanism, for people to know what that is. Why is, is it important? All these topics about Pan-Africanism, which is the uniting of Africa, become more relevant now that the queen has passed. Um, what Barbados did in terms of separating themselves from the queen as, 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 as their prime minister, Mia Motley, um, has made clear, and uh, Commission, the government official with the last name Commission, gave an incredible speech that went viral um, for Jamaicans because he talked about what Jamaica has to do, um, which is what Barbados already did, in order to no longer be under the control of the Queen. Uh, Barbados made clear that they are no longer under the Queen's directive control. Uh, Jamaica can do the same through their parliament. However, uh, Commission stated that what is also required to have Jamaica separate from the Queen is a referendum um, uh, that all Jamaicans have to vote for. The ultimate vote has to be in favor of the referendum. And, and again, I think of this novel particularly because it's dealing, the main character is dealing with her mother and the mother of Anna is dealing with breast cancer. But what's fascinating, how Elizabeth Nunez writes it, the mother can barely talk about it. She can barely talk about the cancer in her body in terms of treating it because treatment is the first step to getting rid of it. But she can't talk about it. And just the way Anna struggles with her mother to get her mother, I forget the mother's name, but the mother of Anna is unable to talk about it. And as a result, consequently, the cancer spreads um, because of the silence about it. And so for me, you know, just the cancer in Anna's mother's body is just like this, this, this loyalty to the British crown that so many people have. You know, Oliver Samuels gave a great video. Um, and I grew up watching Oliver Samuels comedy where he said he did not understand why Prime Minister Andrew Holness would 
encourage Jamaica, Jamaica to go into days of mourning. I think at 10 to 12 days of mourning for the queen. He found it um, ludicrous. He said he did not agree with it. And I cannot help but agree with Oliver because I guess for me and for Oliver and for many Jamaicans, loyalty to the queen is now obsolete. You know, why is there this ultimate loyalty, this interest in her life, this um, devotion to her? When, as Oliver said in his video, she don't give us nothing, you know, she just look upon us. So, yeah, but you see from her passing, um, a lot of emotions are flaring up. A lot of people are taking offense um, to people saying they have no respect for the queen. And again, it's an issue of relevancy. Where is the relevancy of the queen and the crown to the ordinary lives of Jamaicans, to the ordinary lives of Americans? Um, it's a big question for me. So. I just wanted to say, when it comes to the queen, I think of the literary work by Elizabeth Nunez because she shows in that novel, just when you have this undying loyalty for something, how that undying loyalty, you know, can questionably, it's like a cancer. It's like, why is this here? And it's not serving you unless you talk about it, unless you deal with it unless you start to deprogram yourself consciously the way that Anna mother, Anna's mother was unable to, that cancer will remain, that cancer will remain. So um, powerful work. I highly encourage you to read this novel, Anna In Between. Also, she's coming out with a new novel, or she's already come out. This novel came out in June. Uh, Professor Provost Elizabeth Nunez, who was provost at Hunter College, published her latest novel called Now Leela Knows. And Professor Nunez emailed me about the themes she would be dealing with in this particular latest novel she has written, Now Leela Knows. And that theme is tokenism, you know, and the ways in which Caribbean immigrants in this country have to fight against it and to make sure that they're not being used to continue the Jim Crow discrimination. Um, and Elizabeth Nunez, as is Paul Marshall, as is uh, Marlon James, as is, but really what stands out to me is Paul Marshall and how her first novel dealt with tokenism, uh, Brown Girl, Brown Stones. And I, I know that Elizabeth Nunez continues to write in that tradition. So I look forward to reading her next one. I haven't finished her next one, but I know this is it. Now Leela knows. Dealing with the academy, U.S. academia, college, university life, um, which was like her previous novel, Beyond the Limbo Silence. Uh, I, I encourage you listeners out there, check out Elizabeth Nunez's latest novel, Now Leela Knows. Congratulations to Cheryl Lee Ralph. I was just watching the sitcom that I saw her in as a little boy called It's a Living. And I remembered you know, seeing her in the um, opening theme. And I knew that the producers were the same producers who did the Golden Girls, but it wasn't as commercially successful. But what a piece of work. And then my parents, um, when I was no more than five years old, I remember my parents telling me, um, they drove me to my grandma's, me and my sister. So my dad and my mom could watch Dream Girls. So they saw Dream Girls on Broadway. Um, what an incredible acting career that Cheryl Lee Ralph has had. She is an incredible role model to uh, all artists out there, including myself, about what it means to persevere, um, to sing a song by Diane Reeves, um, and to hold that Tony the way she did, to sing her song the way that she did, to deliver the kind of message that she did, um, to live the life that she's lived, um, to have the marriage and the children that she's able to have, um, incredible role model. Um, I had tweeted yesterday that my favorite piece of Shirley Ralph's work is season three, episode five of Moesha, when uh, the family Moesha is having a yard sale and Moesha, performed by Brandy, um, is having an emotional meltdown regarding the loss of her mother and felt like, um, her stepmother, who was performed by Cheryl Lee Ralph, was basically trying to push and make Moesha forget her birth mother. What a powerful performance by Brandy and also by Cheryl Lee Ralph. I, I tweeted that 
she balanced that difficult role of a stepmother and a wife beautifully. It's my favorite episode. Check it out if you have time. It's the yard sale um, on Moesha season three, episode five. Uh, amazing performance. I also saw Shirley Graff deliver an incredible dramatic performance about five years ago in Philadelphia by a piece written by my dear playwright friend, Danye Love. The piece was dealing with loss of HIV. And I wanna congratulate Shirley Ralph for her amazing work in the field of HIV awareness. She founded an organization at a time as a witness to you know, the AIDS epidemic where she lost so many friends as did the cast of the original Dreamgirls on Broadway, her former director, Michael Bennett included. Um, so she founded an organization um, that was devoted to raising awareness. And she mentioned on her IG, if you follow, if you look at her IG, that one of the biggest and immediate supporters of her organization for HIV awareness was Janet Jackson. And I just, I just applaud the work she's done. She's obviously an artist that is serious about not just making money, not just um, her name, uh, but about removing stigma. Um, removing stigma, absolutely. And what she did with the role of Dina Jones, what an incredible role that was. Um, because she, her sound was the good mainstream sound. Dina Jones was the good mainstream sounding character, not the black sounding character. Um, the black singing character was Effie and only Jennifer Holliday could really play that. But Dina Jones was the nice sound that was acceptable, very much um, based on the Diana Ross reality compared to Florence Ballard, who had the more earthy, soulful sound. But Shirley Ralph character really represented what the mainstream wanted and the way that the dream girl story goes of her, Dina Jones pushing Effie out for the spotlight, you know, made the whole cast, made the whole audience not root for Dina, but root for Effie. But the way she played the nemesis of Effie, unforgettable. Um, and now her work with Abbott Elementary, which everybody is loving, with the incredible power, awesome power writer, Quinte Brunson. Um, congratulations to Shirley Ralph. I'm so glad we see her getting her flowers now. And I was looking for the image that really inspired my latest blog post and I found it. Um, it is this image from Third Eye Spiritual. And you notice the kids and the color and they're going to school. And then after, and you see how school is a machine, right? And then after they go into the machine, they come out with the graduation caps, you know, and we're, I'm reading this at the beginning of a school year. Um, they come out with the graduation caps, but their demeanor is sad. Their demeanor is controlled. So this cartoon shows how school sometimes can take the fun and the joy out of the creative process. Because if you notice in the cartoon, they have these pipes out of the machine that school is, and on the pipes are words that say creativity, intelligence. So the cartoon is saying, you know, school sucks the intelligence out of children. Um, it sucks the creativity out of children. And this, I was, this was the image that I wanted. I didn't get to post it on my latest essay because I wrote a latest essay responding to something I read in the New Republic. Um, which I, you know, and I have to give full disclosure here. I had solicited an article to the New Republic, and I noticed their editors were women, particularly the um, the literary editor of the New Republic. I forget this editor's name. And I wanted to respond to the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court using the fiction of Toni Morrison, because Toni Morrison herself has said that her novel, which was the most acclaimed novel she ever wrote, Beloved, was really responding to uh, white feminists celebrating the opportunity that they have in the workplace. You know, a mother's um, right to work. And, and she said, there was a time in this country where black women did not even have the right to their own children. So the piece that I pitched to the New Republic originally was showing how motherhood is celebrated. Uh, Morrison was celebrating motherhood in that novel and showing the value of it um, by showing what her character based on Margaret Garner, Setha, had to endure in 
discovering um, she had no right to do what she did in terms of uh, murdering her third child. Uh, but she did that within a historical context that denied her motherhood, right? So I think Morrison's point was that motherhood for black women is valuable, motherhood is desirable. Um, they didn't cry, they didn't take it, they didn't take it. Um, you know, they, they chose not, they chose to pass on that article that I pitched. But I saw uh, this past Sunday, an article written by Keisha Blaine in the New Republic. And she was writing about um, black historians. The title of it was saying, um, there, something about objective history. I wanna make sure I get this title right. I wanna make sure I get this title right. Um, but the point of it, um, and I had to, after I read the piece, I had to really write a response. Her title was Black Historians Know There's No Such Thing as an Objective History. Um, there's no such thing as an objective history. And I found it very peculiar, this title. Um, one of the, yes, she's talking about writing in the academy and what they have to do. And my point, so I wrote a piece on my article, on my blog, on my website. If you go to my website, drronfraser.com, you could read this article. Um, this, the, the title is Black Historians Know There's No Such Thing as an Objective History. And then the summary basically says, recent critiques of presentism, I'm reading from the website, fail to see that we can't divorce the past from the present and that supposedly objective scholarship has long promoted racist narratives and suppressed black history. She later goes on to talk about being somebody in the US Academy, being somebody in the college or university and how as she is a historian in the academy, she has to fight to present certain histories because of the persistence of racism. But after reading her New Republic article and remembering uh, what she did write about two particular figures, Amy Ashwood Garvey, and what she wrote about Fannie Lou Hamer, I mean, she's still writing for a white audience. And so my article argues against Blaine writing for a white audience because it's clear that she's writing about influential black figures in a way that is palatable or acceptable in a way that removes their color, in a way that just makes them bland and basically makes them look like lackeys for the Democratic Party, which they were not, particularly Amy Ashworth Garvey, particularly Fannie Lou Hamer. So if you look at my latest website, I, I detail how exactly Keisha Blaine does that. Um, she turns Amy Ashworth Garvey into a Democratic lackey for the Democratic Party. Um, and she does it basically by focusing on the aspects of Amy Ashwood's life that simply wants to work with white, white allies. And she doesn't talk about the efforts Amy Ashwood did in working with black leaders, in working with independent African nations to ensure their independence and making sure that they do not uh, depend on Europe for everything. So she misses those aspects with Fannie Lou Hamer, um, she gives you important details. What I think is good about her latest book on Fannie Lou Hamer is that Blaine puts Hamer in the context of the Black Lives Matter uh, deaths, Breonna Taylor and those who died at the hands of police brutality, which is helpful. But what's most egregious to me as a scholar of Fannie Lou Hamer myself, who wrote a play about Fannie Lou Hamer, and I wrote a play about Amy Ashwell Garvey, is how at the end of the book on Fannie Lou Hamer, she writes, she compares Hamer to Kamala Harris and mentions Kamala Harris's speech at the August 2020 Democratic National Convention. And, and it's like, no, she was not, if you study Fannie Lou Hamer, you know she challenged the Democratic Party, you know? Kamala Harris mentioning Fannie Lou Hamer is not a fulfillment of Hamer's work. Um, it, it is a strategic, uh, cynical use by the Democratic Party to use radical figures to legitimize itself. 
But those figures that they're using, you know, they fought tooth and nail against the policy of the Democratic Party. When you study, when you remember, when you remember her protests against Theodore Bilbo, when you remember her 1964 speech at the Democratic National Convention asking, I questioned America. When you remember her, as Blaine writes about, um, her and her Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party rejecting the two-seat compromise that Lyndon Johnson offered. It's such a rejection of tokenism um, that she shouldn't be made into the Democratic lackey that Blaine makes her. So I wrote this piece in memory of James Turner, who really warned all of us who came out of Black Studies. James Turner founded the Africana Studies Department at Cornell University and really makes clear, like this cartoon makes clear, that Black Studies should not take the color out of the community's life. It should not keep up that wall. This cartoon is effective because it also shows us that there's a wall between knowledge production and the community that it's supposed to serve. And what Blaine's work is trying to do is basically make these figures into these nice little cookie cutter Democrats. They're not. They challenge the Democratic Party at every turn. They challenge the Democratic Party at every turn. So I, I, I wrote that piece and I want to tell you about my work, about the work of Tony Martin for a fuller look at Amy Ashworth Garvey. Read Tony Martin's titled book, Amy Ashworth Garvey. For a fuller look of Fannie Lou Hamer, you have two biographies uh, about Fannie Lou Hamer, one by first by Kay Mills, who transitioned, and another by China Kai Lee. Uh, but even more effective for me is to praise our bridges where she said, we're just not going to follow a white leader. So she's speaking to the Democratic Party. And in light of the Democratic Party's turning a blind eye to Jackson, Mississippi, the home state of Miss Hamer, not having clean water, yet sending troops all the way, sending, making sure Ukraine has clean water all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to continue this Cold War that has ended since 1990 is ludicrous. You know, Ms. Hamer would not support that. Um, and she writes about this. So, and you can read To Praise Our Bridges when you go to snickdigital.org, S-N-C-C-D-I-G-I-T-A-L.org. Check those books out. Um, ch check this autobiography out, which is online. Um, and I believe it's in the middle, it's not that long of a, read at all. It's about a um, 40 page autobiography, if that. Um, but you really get an essence of Ms. Hamer through her own words and what it was like to grow up in Ruleville, Mississippi. Um, powerful story. Um, just make sure listeners to this, to my YouTube channel, make sure the history that you get is not a cardboard history where Powerful figures are turned into um, automatons, robots, you know, just things that come out of school and have their intelligence and creativity sapped or taken away. Make sure you get the full color. And what an incredible life that Amy Ashwood lived. What an incredible life that Fannie Lou Hamer lived that was full of color. And at the end of their life, they did not want their legacies to be used to promote the Democratic Party. Um, I also want to encourage you to look out for my upcoming book. It is called To a More Positive Purpose, and it focuses specifically on the scholarship of Tony Martin, which includes that biography of Amy Ashwood Garvey. Um, it is scheduled for publication. I'm working, talking with the publisher um, on a regular basis to make sure it will come out by the end of June. This, this June approaching. Tony Martin has allowed us a wonderful service in terms of knowing who Marcus Garvey is, making knowledge of Marcus Garvey available to the world. And so what you see in this image is several books that he made sure was printed. On the top left is Literary Garveyism, which was um, his history of Garvey's influence on the Harlem Renaissance, how his Negro World newspaper allowed, opened a door for a whole slew of amazing Black artists, including Zora Neale Hurston, 
Claude McKay to be known by the world, all because of Garvey's newspaper, the Negro World newspaper. Tony Martin writes about that in Literary Garveyism. Then at the, in the middle here in the blue, light blue, is the Jewish onslaught about his experience at Wellesley College as a former chair of Africana studies there. Then at the bottom left, you see Marcus Garvey Hero, which is a great book that I taught at, at, at the elementary school level. He wrote it for a high school audience, but absolutely um, students at the elementary school level can understand it. So I highly recommend, it's no more than about 130 pages. Um, so I highly recommend Marcus Garvey Hero, a first biography. That was, um, that was what he wrote for a general audience, for a younger audience. Um, and in the middle, at the bottom, you see Caribbean history. That was the very last book he published. Um, his wife, his former wife, who I interviewed, Dr. Paloma Martin, helped to um, publish that book. Um, the subtitle is From Pre-Colonial Origins to the Present. Um, Tony Martin deals with so much from the Spanish colonization of the Caribbean to the French, to the English, to the Maroons in Suriname, to the commercial success of Usain Bolt, to World War II, to um, the passing of Walter Rodney, the murder of Walter Rodney, to the murder of Maurice Bishop, to the Cuban Revolution. He deals so much with so many topics in that book, Caribbean History. Then on the lower right, you see the poetical works of Marcus Garvey. He printed that around the same time. Um, he printed Literary Garveyism in the mid 80s. Um, and that is a collection of poems written by Marcus Garvey when he was in prison between 1925 and 1927 before he was deported back to Jamaica. Um, and um, he has an, a powerful, amazing, long epic poem in that book. Um, he also has hymns that Garvey wrote um, for the UNIA, powerful. Um, in the middle on the right is Amy Ashwood Garvey, amazing 400 page biography that he wrote um, that chronicles her life that included travels across the United States, across Africa, across Europe. Um, unlike her first husband, Marcus Garvey, she did in fact make it to Africa. And um, like Keisha Blaine's book does not say, she does in fact make inroads with African leaders for the purpose of strengthening the independence of African nations so that they do not depend on the West. An amazing read. Uh, amazing read, uh, amazing biography, probably um, the most influential biography in my life. And then the top right is Martin's seminal work on Marcus Garvey, a seminal scholarly work uh, about Marcus Garvey called Race First. Um, and when you read his doctoral dissertation, um, Tony Martin's doctoral dissertation, which is University of Michigan, uh, I believe 1970, uh, you see how the structure of his dissertation basically is like this book that comes out about six years later that he self-publishes. Um, it's an amazing tome about Marcus Garvey. He does not write it chronologically, which is what made it difficult. It took me almost a decade to read Race First because of how he structured it. But once I understood the structure, uh, it was not chronological, which is how I read most biographies. I was able to understand why when I noticed the themes that he set out that he wrote in the introduction. I highly recommend it. So in this whole book, and it's a 200 page survey that I wrote, um, this book called To a More Positive Purpose does not only include my writings of this survey, 200 page survey, it includes 20 to 30 page articles by various contributors, including Joshua Myers, Ian Smart, Rupert Lewis, novelist Jeffrey Philp, literary scholar, Wendy McBurney, literary scholar April Shemak, and a former colleague of Dr. Tony Martin is Ofra Davis. And so I'm grateful for, and Latif, history professor at Elizabeth City University, 
in North Carolina. Uh, Professor Latif Tariq also has an article um, in this awesome collection. So check this book out, okay? Thank you for joining my 15th YouTube Live. Check out my website. If you have been blessed by what I shared in the past half hour, support my Cash App. Give to my Cash App, dollar sign, Ron Fraser. Again, congratulations to the amazing Elizabeth Nunez on her latest novel that came out in June. Congratulations to the amazing Cheryl Lee Ralph for earning her Emmy this week. Check out my website. Stay tuned for my book. God bless you.